Okay, so we've talked about particles, we've talked about waves, and so now we're going to actually go back to the subject of light and ask, is it a particle or a wave? And this is a historic debate between, well, I'll get a new page. It's a debate between Newton, there he is again, and Huygens. Now, what's up with the hair back there? <laughs> oh, well, whatever. Uh, Newton versus Huygens. H-U-Y-G-E-N-S. Um, Huygens uh, was also an astronomer. Newton, I mean, clearly he's thinking about astronomy back then. The physicists, the astronomers, they just did it all. Newton argued that light was a particle. And Huygens argued that it was a wave. And as we'll see, Huygens is more right, but Newton's also right. It's kind of tricky. As I said, it's subtle. They made their arguments, and later on through history, uh, these things were tested. There are three primary tests. The first test is diffraction. Diffraction is the bending of waves. So let's take the case, oh, I have it up here already. Here I have a wall, and there's been a slit cut out in the wall. In fact, it uh, looks a lot like this. This is for something else, but since I have it here, here's a wall, a slit, a particular shape has been cut out of it. And so if I throw particles up against this, like if I put it here and like shot it with buckshot, well, it just tear this all to shreds. But if it were a good wall, it would stop the buckshot here. The buckshot that hits, or that would have hit here, goes through the slit and will make a shadow on the wall. It's shaped exactly like the shape of the slit. Make sense? With particles, it would just trace out the shape of the slit, and as is uh, diagram here. So we have a wall with the shape cut into it. If light is a particle, then some of the light will be blocked, some will go through the slit, and hit the screen. The screen is just a detector. We can either look at it with our eyes, or maybe it's a, a digital camera and we can take a picture of it. Anyway, we can record it. So we can do this experiment. That's what we expect if light is a particle. It should look like that. If light's a wave, it should look a little different. A little movie for that. It's loading. Okay, I'm going to carry it over here. Okay. We'll take a look at this. We'll throw waves up against a slit. We'll use water waves. Let's start with macroscopic waves that we can see with our eyes real easily. Water waves. Um, in fact, you could do this at home. You could do this experiment at home. It's real simple. Uh, you get all your textbooks and climb in the bathtub and fill it with water. Not all, you know, just a little bit of water. And with your textbooks, build a barrier. It's a little opening. Yeah, so, you know, you have to get new textbooks, but whatever. And then you get in, and with one textbook, you kind of bob up and down. You splash in the water, up and down. That's setting up waves, and the waves will propagate across your bathtub. They'll run into the barrier. And you know water waves are waves. So this is an example of waves hitting the exact same barrier with an opening. The question is, how do waves behave as it tries to get through? So, I mean, you can do it at home if you don't believe me, but here I have a video that shows you how it goes. I would do this experiment here, except it's really hard for everyone to see. So here's a video of a ripple tank. Ooh, MIT. <laughs> okay, here's our ripple tank. So we have a shallow tank of water, so that's like the bathtub there. And as you've seen a bit, there's already a barrier with the slit there, an opening. I'll continue on. There's the ripple generator. So this is just a bar that's going to go up and down, setting up waves in the water. They will impact it against this barrier with the slit. Here's a light source. Sometimes it's hard to see the ripples, and so they have a light that shines down through it, bounces off a mirror, and so it's projected on the screen. Uh, you can sometimes see the waves a little bit better on the screen, so we'll examine it that way. Okay, here's a blow up here. Here you see the barrier with the slit, and there's the um, plane wave generator. It's going to bob up and down and set up the waves. So here it goes. Okay, so it's setting up the waves. 
They're hitting the opening, and what are they doing? Well, I said diffraction is the bending of waves, so let's take a look here. Projector. You can see they're coming in parallel, but when they go through the opening, they're not coming out parallel. What's the shape on the other side of the opening? Kind of circular. They bend as they go through. And this bending depends intimately on the size of the opening. If the opening is the same size as the wavelength to get the most amount of bending. If the opening's way bigger than the wavelength, the waves just kind of go through, except around the edges. You'll see this because they're going to open up the, the opening now. Instead of having nice perfect circles, as we go to the bigger opening, it's coming up, I swear. Here we go. Here's the bigger opening. You can see so the way, at least in the middle, it's just going straight through and staying relatively straight. But on the edges, you still get the bending. As you go around the edge, you're going to get a bend. He said it still shows wave properties. You just get the most bending, the most diffraction, if the slit is about the same size as your wavelength. That's the case with any wave. This is just water waves. Let me close this down. Okay, so that's the expectation if light's a particle. Here's the expectation if light is a wave, at least based upon what we just saw with water waves. If light's a wave, the wave fronts will come up, up against the wall. Some of it will impact the wall, some of it will hit the opening. If the opening is similar in size to the wavelength of the light, if light is indeed a wave, then it will bend as it goes through. And then when it finally comes to your screen, your detector, the fronts are curved, but the detector is straight. So you can imagine, if we just do a cross-section through these bending wave fronts, what do we have? Coming down through here, we would have dark, and then light, and then dark again, and then light, and dark, and light, and so forth and so on. You get a repeating pattern of dark light, dark light, when you're trying to project this curved behavior onto a flat surface. So you get what's described here as a fuzzy shadow. It's not one rectangle, but it's a repeating sequence of rectangles, dark and light. So here are the two predictions, and we're just going to do the experiment. I have a laser here, nice bright green laser. It's a single wavelength. You know, if light's a wave, it's a single wavelength. And I have um, a slit. Well, I had one. This was my slit here, and but I lost it. But I brought another one that's almost as good. So. If you can't quite see that, there are little slits cut out here. There's kind of a, a foil and little slits are cut. They look just kind of like this one. The one I have there has single slits. So I'm going to take the laser and shine it through a single slit, and we're going to just project it up here, and you tell me what you see. If you see a single rectangle, lights a particle. You see a repeating pattern, lights a wave. Now let me uh, turn off all the lights to do this. And it's, it's hard to hit the slit perfectly with the laser. And this foil is reflective, so it kind of blinds me. But uh, just bear with me, we'll do this. Let me make sure I got the single slit, yeah? Okay. It may take a second to orient, but... Okay, you see up there? Is that a single slit or a repeating pattern of slits? A repeating pattern, yeah? So, uh, it's hard getting the green laser back at you in your eyeball, but uh, that's okay. Let's put the lights back on. So that was a demonstration of diffraction. Oh, there's more coming. There's more coming. So according to that test, light is a wave. Next test, interference. This is the mixing of waves. Okay. At first, interference seems just like diffraction times two. But you'll see this gets pretty subtle and pretty weird really quick. So here we have a bound here water waves again. The water waves are coming pretty much flat against the boundary from below. There are two slits this case, in this case, and they're both about the same size as the wavelength, as you can see if you look carefully. You get two diffraction patterns, and those diffraction patterns are going to mix together, interfere with itself, with each other. And so what do I mean by interference? If you have two waves, overlapping each other. They can either be in sync or out of sync. And what that means is if you have crest intersecting with crest, uh, they'll add together and you have twice as strong of a signature. 
and we call this constructive interference, where the two waves are in phase when they touch one another, so you get highs and lows. You can also have destructive interference. If they're out of phase, the crest will add to the trough, canceling out, and it cancels out everywhere along the pattern. And so we see examples of both of that here. Here's a crest adding to a crest. Uh, the dark regions are troughs adding to troughs. And like here, you have a crest adding to a trough, and this is kind of the, the normal level of the water when everything's turned off. So you get a different pattern. Imagine intersecting this with uh, a screen or a detector. You're going to have a different pattern, bright, dark, bright, dark. It's going to be a repeating pattern, but it's going to be uh, different than just single slit diffraction. So, I mean, that's not too hard to envision. We'll just do that real quick here. And uh, this time we'll use uh, the double slit. And I'll try to hold it steady. Okay, so you see there again, it's this repeating pattern of light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, but it's a different pattern than we had before, and that's an interference pattern. And if light was particle in nature, you'd just get two bars. But instead, you're getting this whole sequence of bars. So that's another test of the wave nature of light. So wave again. But Newton would object. He said, okay, wait a minute here. So this is what I just did. I shined the light through two slits. We got this whole sequence here. So the light was a wave. That each wave went through both openings, interfered with itself, and made this pattern. But Newton says, you know, well, water, when we sent water through the two slits, we got this pattern. But we know water, although waves can travel in water, water itself is a particle. You know, water is H2O. The red is the O, and the two whites are the H. So it's really a whole bunch of particles that are impacting up on these slits. And maybe it's only because it's a whole bunch of particles acting together, it behaves like a wave. There are bonds, intermolecular forces, attracting one of these to the one next to it. They're kind of connected. Not absolutely, they're, you know, they move around one another, but they feel each other's presence all the time. As they move up onto the, the barrier here and go through these slits, Newton would argue, the only reason they're bending is because they're intermolecular connections. It's like all the molecules are trying to go through and they're holding hands as they go through and they bulge out. So he'd say, yeah, it's behaving as a wave, but it's really a bunch of particles interacting in that way. So he, he proposes the way to do this would be, and we couldn't do it then, but we can do it now, just send one little bit of light through at a time. And you send like one molecule of water. Let's go back to the water analogy. Here we're throwing water up against the wall, but just one molecule at a time. It has no other molecules to interact with as it goes through the slit. It's either going to hit the wall, go through one slit, or go through the other. We do one at a time and keep doing it. Eventually, the pattern will flesh out. And if light is a particle, the same deal. You'd see those two bright bars if you send them through one at a time, or at least Newton argues that. But Huygens says, no, it's a wave. Even if you send one quantum, the smallest bit of light that you can muster, it will go through as a wave and interfere with itself. So let's do that test. In, in the modern day, it's been done. So here we have one piece of light. And you think, okay, a piece of light, that looks like a particle. You have some device, maybe it's an atom, it transitions and releases a photon. That's what we call one piece of light, a photon. It's kind of released as a single unit from a single point in space. You kind of think it's a particle. It goes through the two slits, passes through one of them, if it's a particle, both if it's a wave, and then hits the screen, and then it's detected at a single location. You say, well, it's detected at a single location. It doesn't look like a wave to me. It looks like a particle. If it's a particle, it went through one slit or the other. And you can throw in some more, doing them one at a time here. Now, it's not looking like two slits. That's what you get. This should, this should be fundamentally disturbing. Uh, any physicist who says they understand why the universe behaves this way, they're lying to you. This bothers me to my core. We have one snippet of light. We release it as a particle. It's detected as a particle. Though when it went through, it had to go through as a wave. So as light travels, it travels as a wave. 
It went through both slits, interfered with itself, clearly, because that's the pattern we get. So when it hits the detector, it becomes a particle again. It picks its location probabilistically. Now, if that's what the wave pattern is, we call it a wave function, as soon as it hits that detector and we try to measure its position, try to observe it, it picks one position. It's more likely to be on one of the stripes, one of the bright stripes than the dark stripes. And it picks it randomly. The act of observation forces the wave to become a particle again. Does that bother you? Does it sound stupid? And why does the universe work that way? We, we can't tell you why the universe works that way, but it does work that way. As long as we're not looking, the light travels as a wave. When we look and try to measure where it is, it says, nope, I'm a particle. You, you can never catch it being a wave, but you can prove that it's traveling as a wave because it went through the two openings and had to as a wave. Otherwise, it would have two slits there. So that, that's the sense in which they're both kind of right. Huygens was right. It is indeed traveling as a wave, that when we detect it, it is a particle. Very disturbing. And um, it's the foundation of quantum mechanics. And we'll talk a little bit more about quantum mechanics as we go throughout the course in the next course. The third test is polarization. We're doing good on time. So polarization is the orientation of waves. Okay. So a wave, if it's a transverse wave anyway, it's oscillating in a plane. Some can oscillate like this, some can oscillate this way, some maybe at a 45 degree angle. And light, usually coming from stars in the universe, you have all the different orientations. Now let's start with macroscopic example here. Here we have, uh, again, here's my giant slit. If light is a particle, and I throw this particle kind of at the middle of the slit, it will go through no matter how I orient the slit. If the slit's up down, it goes through. If the slit's left right, it goes through. If the slit's at a 45 degree angle, it goes through, because it's a particle. But if light's a wave, it does make a difference. It's only going to go through if the wave is oscillating in the same orientation as the slit. So let's demonstrate that. Two more volunteers. Okay, one, two. <laughs> so come on up. Okay, so you take that end. And you get this end. You and I will go way over here. Now normally I'd stay in the middle, but the slit's not big enough, so go ahead a little bit farther. So I'll stay kind of off to the side. Go ahead, just one of you, set up a wave. The other just hold it there. So you see, the wave can go through the slit when it's oriented this way, no problem. Except my slit's a little too short. If I come here, it's a little bit better, okay? But now, if I change the orientation of the slit this way, the wave is clamped out. The wave cannot make it through. If I come here in the middle, you're really trying. <laughs> my patience. No, it's okay. <laughs> so that's the uh, experiment there. Thank you. Oh, you can let go. So thank you. Give them a little round of applause there. Okay, so that was a macroscopic wave. The idea, if light's a particle, it doesn't matter the orientation. But if it's a wave, it will matter. So what I have here is the same idea, not one slit, but a whole bunch of slits right up against each other, and I need a light source. So let me, I brought an overhead projector here, and I'll plug it in. Maybe I'll kill the dock cam? No, no, let's kill my laptop. Okay. My laptop's not very smart, but oh well. Might do. Okay, so here we go. This is uh, emitting light, and I've already convinced you light at least travels as a wave, and it's in all sorts of different orientations. Some of it's traveling this way, some up down, some left right, some at all sorts of different angles. Here I have a polarizer. Let's see, I'll save this one. Okay. So I'll just stick the polarizer over here. What is a polarizer? Well, it's basically slits. And the slit, for the, all this to work, you kind of want the slits, the openings, to be on the same scale as your wave. So what this is, is a bunch of slits really close to each other. 
It's made out of carbon, just like you are. Carbon, well, I had a little side here. Carbon is this really special atom, and its outer layer has four electrons and four openings. So it's four places to bond on, and it just bonds with like everything, including itself. You can get carbon attaching to carbon attaching to carbon, in these really long carbon chains. And you can like uh, attach hydrogen on there, and then we call it hydrocarbons, oil, gasoline is made of these carbon chains, plastic is made of oil, so plastic is also made of these carbon chains. You are carbon-based because carbon bonds in so many ways, you can very easily build complicated <coughs> molecules and hence complicated organisms out of them. Well, anyway, they're manufacturing processes where we can line these carbon chains up side by side. So here's a line, here's a line, here's a line, here's a line. And that's all a polarizer is. It's a bunch of slits here, all oriented in the same way. So if the light's oscillating like this, it will go through. If it's oscillating like this, it won't go through. The projector is making all sorts of different orientations. I put this on, and only one orientation makes it through. But I can take another polarizer, and if I put it on the same orientation, it shouldn't change much. Now, half the light was blocked out by this, because it was oscillating the wrong way. But the light that made it through is still oscillating up down. I put this in the same orientation, it just goes straight through. But what will happen if light's a wave when I rotate this? It should go black. If it's a particle, it'll still go through all the various holes between the polar polarizers going this way and this way. So here we go. Proof the light is a wave. Mm. Isn't that cool? Light? No light. Okay. Um, all sorts of good applications for polarizers. If you're a fisherman, you probably have polarized sunglasses because when the sunlight's coming down and it's hitting the water top, it bounces off and gets polarized. It's polarized left, right, uh, same as the surface of the water, and it makes this glare, and you just see the glare of the sun. But if you're wearing polarized sunglasses going up, down, all that light's blocked out, and you can see straight into the water and see the fish. Uh, another example, fighter pilots. At least back in World War II they did it this way. They had goggles with two polarizers. They're flying along, they keep them oriented the same, let the light in, but if they're turning into the sun, they can rotate one, not all the way, because then you can't see anything, but enough to block out the glare of the sun. So all sorts of applications for polarizers. And it shows that light is indeed traveling as a wave. Light. So if light is a wave, this should go black. Isn't that cool? Amazing. So there's another proof right there that light. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. I was going to show you the coolest thing, too. I brought a third one. There's this like special magical thing it does that you can't believe unless you actually see it with your eyes. I just learned about it yesterday, actually. It, I'm so disappointed. Uh, let's see if I can do it with a dot cam somehow. <coughs> Probably not. No, that's just confusing. Maybe if I... Okay, so... <laughs> okay, there we go. Okay, so I'm not going to explain this because it takes take too much time, but anyone who can, I'll be impressed. Here's a third one. I'm going to put it in at a 45 degree angle, so it's not like this. It's coming in this way. If I put it on top, I mean, all the lights block, so if I put it on top, all the lights still block. I put it underneath, all the lights still block. I put it in between, watch this. So ponder that, and maybe I'll explain that next time.